It's great to remember, isn't it, our identity in Christ in the midst of all that's going on. I think the longer lockdown goes on, the more impact it's having in our lives. As I've been speaking with a number of people this week, one struggle that's come up um, a few times is purposelessness. You know, being stuck at home, unable to contribute as we normally would. It can leave us feeling useless, can't it? You know, someone said to me, that they've been thinking, why am I alive each day? Someone else was talking about really struggling to know how to use their time usefully day after day. And purposelessness can be a real struggle, can't it? And maybe for some of us, actually, that's been a struggle in the church over the years. This week, I I heard someone make a joke that when it comes to the established church, all they want from people is to show up, pay up, and shut up. Now, I hope that hasn't been your experience here at Sunbridge Road Mission. But maybe you've, you've got the impression somehow that being part of a church is largely a passive thing. Maybe by nature you're somebody who wants to get involved, you know, to get your hands dirty. And in, in your mind, if, if being part of the church just means being another bum on a chair, it's not that inspiring. Well, the passage we're going to be looking at this morning tells us that if we've got that impression of the church, something's gone wrong. It, it paints a very different picture. Speaking of the church as something organic, something alive, something active and focused, where everyone has a part to play. So this um, term, we've been looking at the book of Ephesians, and we've just got to the kind of turning point of the letter. You know, the first three chapters were really about all God has done. You are united in Christ. And these last three chapters are really about how we live out that unity. You are united, so be united. Live it out. And we've been seeing in in the first three chapters, you know, the, the building project that God is building, a new humanity in the Lord Jesus. And then we we come really into how we live out that wonderful calling. And as we go through over these next weeks, this week we're looking at chapter 4, verses 1 to 16, which really starts with the general principles, the kind of big picture of how we now relate to one another if we're united in Christ. And then um, next Sunday morning, Jez uh, Stockhill's going to be preaching. um, And really next week we get into the nitty-gritty of how we relate to one another. It looks at our, our speech our attitudes, our behaviours. And then we look at some specific relationships, husband and wives, parents and children. And then at the end of Ephesians, we come to the armour of God, and Paul directs us to to God's help in all that. So today is kind of the big picture of how we relate to one another within the church. What does it mean to be part of a church? So let's um, read together Ephesians 4, um, verses 1 to 16. As a prisoner for the Lord then... I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. Now throughout this passage, the picture Paul uses is that of a body, 
Okay, so just take a moment, look down at your body for a moment. Okay, what, what do you notice? There's diversity, isn't there, as you, as you look down at your body? Hands, elbows, stomach, knees, feet, little hairs on your skin. And many of those parts are very different to one another, aren't they? So we see the difference. You know, a, a fingernail and a thigh bone are very different. But also, you know, but as you look down at your body, do you just see lots of kind of separate pieces? Well, no, we don't, do we? As well as diversity, there is unity. Your body is an integrated whole. You don't relate to your hand separately to your arm. We have one body. And Paul says it's the same in the church. There is both unity and diversity. And, and he starts with the more fundamental of the two, unity. This is in verses 1 to 6. One body... So work hard at maintaining peace. You know, so in this room, every head has one body with it. You know, there's, no, there's no one here, is there, with, a, with multiple bodies. One body, and it's the same with Jesus. And to be a Christian is to have Jesus as your head. It is to sit under his rule. And if Jesus is your head, then you are part of his body. So we don't all interact with Jesus kind of independently of one another. There isn't a separate body for Jews and for Gentiles. To be part of the church, to have Jesus as our head, is to be part of the one body of Christ. Now, where does that oneness come from? Well, verse 4 to 6 make that really clear, don't they? Our unity comes from God and what he has done in Jesus. So do you see in verse 4, the word that kept coming back up over and over again was one, wasn't it? One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father over all. Our oneness comes from God's oneness. You know, there aren't lots of different versions of Jesus. There aren't lots of different models of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's one Father, one Lord, one Spirit. And, and our unity comes from what God has done in Christ Jesus. Remember a few weeks ago we were seeing it's the cross, isn't it, that unites us. So actually there's not lots of different versions of the Christian faith. There's one hope. One faith, one baptism. In, in Christ, God has united us into one body. Now, I imagine at this point, some of you might be thinking, look, this idea of one body sounds great, Matthew. It doesn't really seem to match what I see in front of me. You know, even as you walk around Bradford, there's all kinds of different churches. Catholics, Methodists, Baptists, Anglican, Independent. And they don't always seem to get on very well. And even within one local church, like, like Sunbridge Road Mission, people don't always get along. There's different groups with different opinions. Well, it's important to remember, isn't it, when it comes to the church, there are two different perspectives. There's, there's God's perspective. And God sees unity. He sees all those who are truly in Christ as one body. And one day, that's how the church will be revealed. And then there's our perspective. And it doesn't always look that way, does it? Because actually, we don't always live out our unity. Let me give you a couple of illustrations which might help. Okay, so think firstly of the United Kingdom. Okay, for a, so if we get off the, the, the next slide up. Think of the United Kingdom. You know, if someone has kind of just dropped in, in into the UK, maybe you're, you've recently arrived in the UK, and you said, is, is the United Kingdom united? But it doesn't always look very united, does it? Certainly at the moment. You know, think of the squabbles over COVID. Think of the jokes people tell. Think of different accents. Think of the kind of fight for independence. Think of the arguments that are going on politically. But actually, we are united, aren't we? You know, there's, there's one law in the end, ultimately. We're one nation. There's, there's one government in the end. One language, one army. Do you see, we are united, actually, but we're not necessarily living it out. Or look at this next picture. What's the problem in this picture? They're, they're on the same team, aren't they? They're on, they shouldn't be fighting. So are they united? Well, actually, ultimately, they are, aren't they? They're on the same team. They, they, they're, you have the same manager. They're working to the same end. But right now, they're not living out their unity. And that's what Paul is saying here. He looks at the church in Ephesus. He looks at Sunbridge Road Mission. And he says, look, you're on the same team. In Christ, you're part of one body. 
Okay, we can take that picture down now, thanks. So, so Paul is saying, live it out. Work hard at maintaining peace. And look at what he recommends in verses 2 and 3. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, why are humility and gentleness so significant? You know, I think these are very carefully chosen words. If we can have the next slide up. It might be helpful to think of their opposites. So someone who is humble, or maybe we'll start with the other one. The opposite to humility is pride, isn't it? Someone who's proud is kind of always thinking about themselves. And they're puffed up. You know, their view of themselves is a bit inflated. You think of a balloon or a puffer fish or something. You know, and what does that mean? It means they're very, proud people are very easy to offend, aren't they? Because they're always thinking about themselves and how they come across. So if their pride is injured, it doesn't take very much to do that. Or if, you know, if they're inflated, they're easy to deflate, aren't they? So, so actually, where, there's, where we're full of pride, we're easily offended. The opposite of that is humility. Now, I don't think humility is, prim- is, is about having a low view of ourselves. Sometimes that's what we think humility is, isn't it? That we, we kind of think of ourselves as rubbish. I think humility is better understood as we think less of ourselves and we're thinking more of others. So the humble person isn't self-consumed, they're thinking about others. And actually, when we're humble, when we're thinking about others, we're quite hard to offend, aren't we? You know, things kind of bounce off. Because we're not primarily thinking about ourselves, we're thinking about them and how they might find something. Again, you know, think about gentleness. What's the opposite of gentleness? It's harshness, isn't it? And again, I don't know if the animal illustration is helpful, but I I was thinking of something like a hedgehog or a porcupine. You know, when we're harsh, it's like we've got spikes, isn't it? And whenever anyone gets close to us, they get hurt. You know, or it's like we're constantly throwing out these kind of grenades and wondering why it is that people around us seem to be suffering. You know, if harshness easily offends people, doesn't it? Gentleness is exactly the opposite. See, when we're gentle, we make it difficult for people to be offended. And do you see how then humility and gentleness breed peace, don't they? Because actually, we're slow to get offended and we're slow to offend others. So Paul says, be, be humble and gentle. And I was reading something recently which says, you know, that what we're aiming for is to have a tough skin and a tender heart. I found that very helpful. The problem is when it's the other way around. You know, the problem is, isn't it, when we've got tender skin and a tough heart. And, I, and, and then Paul talks about patience. You know, and patience is giving other people time, isn't it? You know, we don't expect them to get it right straight away. You know, we give people time to change and to respond. And bearing with one another, I think, is giving each other the benefit of the doubt. You know, sometimes we're just waiting for someone to to make a mistake, aren't we? We're just waiting for them to to say the wrong thing, and then we jump on them. Well, bearing with one another is exactly the opposite. You know, we always presume the best of them. We we always give them the benefit of the doubt. And, And lastly, Paul tells us to work hard at maintaining peace. And that's quite insightful, isn't it? It means that living out our unity actually takes work. It doesn't happen automatically. And working hard um, to maintain peace always takes longer, doesn't it? It always requires more effort. It means that maybe you've had a conversation with someone and you just sense something wasn't quite right. You follow up. You you check in. You you find out how they're doing. Or you know that someone else was hurt and again, uh, you you respond. You apologise perhaps if you need to do that. It always takes a bit more effort, doesn't it? to maintain unity. So sometimes I think around this whole topic, the question we ask ourselves is, are we being divisive? And if we think, look, I'm not being divisive, I haven't thrown any punches, I didn't swear at anyone, you know, I haven't kind of deliberately gone in to cause trouble, then we, then we let ourselves off, don't we? We say we're fine. The question Paul would ask is, are we working hard at maintaining peace? You see the difference? That's a bit different, isn't it? That's active. Are we working hard at maintaining peace? So, you know, think about what this means for us as a church family. I think when you come into a church family new, um, after the time, you start to see where there are little cracks, where there are tensions between people, wounds maybe from over the years, bitterness. And, and it's, um, sometimes what, what you, know, you see is that rather than working through something, people have worked around it. So actually that issue hasn't been resolved. People haven't worked hard at unity. We've just found a way to kind of be in the same place without bringing it up. 
And actually, I think we, we need to hear this, particularly at the moment, don't we, this idea of working hard at maintaining peace. Because when we're struggling, and I think all of us are struggling, I'm certainly struggling with all that's going on, often we're harsh and impatient with others, aren't we? You know, often when we're struggling, actually, we lash out, we're spiky uh, to others. So actually, during this time, how much more do we need uh, to be humble and gentle and working hard at maintaining peace? Or think about how we relate to other churches. You know, I think what this means is our instinct should be charity and cooperation rather than suspicion and separation. Now, obviously, there are times, aren't there, when we can't work with other churches. The faith they proclaim is not the faith of the apostles. But actually, if that is the case, that should sadden us, shouldn't it? We should do that with a heavy heart. That should bother us. We should long for unity for for a day when that's not the case. I think sometimes, particularly for an independent church like us, there's a danger of a kind of proud independence, isn't there? A kind of gleeful independence. But you see how, how... You know, we should care about unity. We should work towards unity wherever we're able. And in the church, you know, unity doesn't mean we're all the same. This isn't like some kind of, you know, factory production line, just, you know, all these Christians kind of churned off, looking exactly the same. Just like in a body, within the church, there's diversity. So this is in verse 7 to 13. Diversity. Many parts, so use your gifts to serve others. So we can have the next slide up. So think again about a body. You know, it has lots of different parts which all contribute in a different way, doesn't it? And, and actually, you need each part to be contributing for the body to be functioning well. Think of a, a really simple thing like eating food. You know, you need the hand to pick the food up, don't you? The teeth to break the food into smaller parts. The, the tongue to enable you to swallow the food. The stomach to break the food down further the intestine to process the food and make it useful to the body, the blood vessels to circulate nutrients to different parts of the body so they can benefit from it. And if you're a biologist, I might have got some of that wrong, but you, you get the idea. You know, you, and you wouldn't, none of us would want a body, would we, that's all hands or all teeth or all intestine. And Paul says, look, it's the same in the church. God has given each person in the church different gifts. And actually, the church is healthy when each person is contributing according to the gift that God has given them. So look at verse 7. But to each of us, grace, and and the word grace and gift are the same root. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to many people. And the image here in mind is of a conquering king returning home. And as he processes in triumph, he shares the spoils of his conquest, scattering gifts among his people. Now, Jesus is the conquering king, isn't he? And as he ascends to heaven in triumph, he doesn't leave us empty-handed. Through his spirit, he's given us gifts to use in building up the body. And, you know, within the New Testament, there's a number of different lists that explicitly mention 20 gifts, things like teaching, encouraging, prophesying, giving, leading, showing mercy, healing, hospitality, evangelism, administration. A huge variety, isn't there, of gifts? And that's not the full 20. And actually, the 20 mentioned explicitly, that's not meant to be exhaustive. You know, there's plenty of other gifts that God has given um, to, to, for people to contribute to the body. You think of, for example, the gift of music, uh, even this morning. And I think when we start talking about spiritual gifts, there's always a danger, isn't there? That, Well, there's a couple of dangers. One is of pride and boasting. You know, we think that those gifts somehow are credit to us. Maybe we're a talented musician, or we're wealthy, or or we're a good Bible teacher. There's a danger that we kind of take pride in that, or we boast in it. But you see what this is saying? All those things are gifts. They were given to us by Jesus. And actually, they were given for a purpose. to to be a resource for us to use to serve the church. And that changes it, doesn't it? Suddenly the emphasis isn't on boasting, but on responsibility and opportunity. If we've been given gifts, that's an opportunity to serve. And actually God will hold us accountable. He'll say, what did you do with that gift I gave you? Because that was for others, not just for you. The other danger, I think, is is a, a feeling of kind of shame or insufficiency. You know, we can feel like, well, I'm not gifted. The, The Lord hasn't given me any of these gifts. But again, you see what this passage says. He's given everyone gifts to use. And look, some of the gifts are more prominent and more visible, aren't they? 
Some of them are in the background. But that doesn't make them more or less important. Think again of the body. You know, is the arm more important than the kidney? No, it isn't, is it? And actually, when some of those hidden parts go wrong, you know about it, don't you? So maybe an example in the church context would be the gift of encouragement. Often that's quite unseen. A little word after a service, a text message to someone, a card. You know, often it's, it's not seen, is it? it's not all upfront stuff. But I'll tell you now that when that isn't being exercised in the, in the church, things quickly start falling apart. You know, I think a church without encouragement is like a car trying to run without oil. You know, before long, things start rubbing up against each other. Now, if, if everyone has been given gifts, why is it Paul then focuses on five gifts here in particular? So look at verses 11 to 12. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Well, these five are highlighted not because they're the only gifts that matter, but because they have a unique role. What all five of these have in common is that they're gifts associated with speaking God's word to people. And because of that, they have a unique role in equipping all of God's people to use their gifts to serve one another. So let me just go through these for a moment. So apostles and prophets are first. You know, apostles here is referring to Jesus' chosen representatives. You know, those who are eyewitness, those who first took the gospel. So think of Paul taking the gospel to the Gentiles, or Peter. You know, they they were eyewitness, they were commissioned by Jesus. Um, And um, prophets here, again, isn't talking about Isaiah and Jeremiah, kind of Old Testament prophets. It's talking about New Testament prophets, other individuals, you know, right at the beginning of the early church, who would take the gospel out to people, who would reveal the gospel. So the apostles and the prophets have quite a unique role. You know, they, do you remember what Paul was saying before about the mystery of the gospel? And it's through the apostles and the prophets that what God has done is revealed, it's made known. And ultimately, you know, that's done in two ways. Back, it, back in the early church, before they had the scriptures, that was done by going and speaking. You know, the church for, for, for a number of decades didn't have God's word written down. They didn't have the gospel, kind of, as we would do, you know, in front of us, in print. So actually, the apostles and the prophets would go to people, um, you know, to reveal to them the good news. Um, And and obviously, they continue to do this now through the scriptures, don't they? You know, the New Testament, who is it that's written the New Testament? Well, as I said before, one of the main criteria for what got in the New Testament was that it had a link to the apostles. You know, the, 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 the New Testament is the apostolic record of what God has done. It's the continuation of Jesus' words. And that means actually the apostles and the prophets don't continue today in a way that they did. You know, the continuation of their role is here in the scriptures. And the the clearest place, I I realize this might be something people want to talk more about, but the the clearest place to see this is actually just a few chapters earlier in Ephesians. So if you've got a Bible, if you flick back to Ephesians 2.20, I think I've got it on a slide too, next one maybe. We, We looked at this a few weeks ago. I'll start from 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Do you see what that's saying? You know, the, the apostles and the prophets laid the foundation. Well, you only lay a foundation once, don't you? And then from that, you build. And the apostles and the prophets laid the foundation because they gave us the gospel. They revealed God's word to us. You know, in the early, in the, the, the first few decades, as they went and preached, uh, but now they continue to do that role through the scriptures. And then we, we hear about the evangelists, if we can have the next slide. And, you know, they have a particular role in taking God's word into new territory, proclaiming the gospel to the unreached. Now, all of us are called to do evangelism, aren't we? All of us are called to share the good news of Jesus, but some are particularly gifted and equipped to take the good news to to new places, uh, into new areas. And then um, the pastors pastors are mentioned, and the role of the pastor is particularly to bring God's word into people's lives. You know, this is caring for the sheep, coming alongside people, you know, maybe meeting up and looking at a passage together, Um, you know, uh, visiting someone uh, when they're ill and unwell and speaking God's word into their life. And then teachers... You know, again, it's a word gift, isn't it? This is particularly taking people deeper into God's word, teaching people the whole counsel of God, 
you know, so that God's people know what God's word says, um, you know, at a, at, a, at a deep level. And often, um, often, you know, te- pastor teacher is combined. You know, so that, those, would be, those would both be things that I do, for example, in my role here. Um, maybe the one way to put it would be to say that most pastors are teachers, but not all teachers are pastors. So we can think of people, can't we, who have a real teaching ministry, but aren't actually involved in pastoring, kind of walking alongside people in that way. Now, why has Paul singled these five out? It's because they have a unique role in equipping all of God's people to serve. Now, the the Greek word for service is the same word we translate ministry. So the, the role of pastors and teachers, for example, is to equip all of God's people to do ministry. Think perhaps of a sports team. Okay, so I think there's a picture coming up. This is the only one I could find last night. I think this is Bath rugby team. Um, You know, in a sports team, there are all kinds of different players, aren't there? Particularly in a game like rugby, you know, you've got different positions. People need to have different strengths. You know, some are six foot five, some are not that. You know, all kind of different kind of shapes and sizes. But there's also some other people. So if you look in those photographs, you know, there's six people there, aren't there, who are wearing different kind of clothes, you know, who, who are singled out in some way. Well, who are they? They're the coaching staff. And they're singled out because their role is different, isn't it? The the job of the coaching staff is to enable the players to reach their full potential, to get them fit, to get them playing together well, to equip them to go out and use their strengths, whether they're a prop or a fullback or a wing, to contribute to the team as a whole. And in Ephesians 4, these five roles are singled out like that. You know, the the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, if you like, they're the, the, the coaching team to equip the rest of the church for ministry. Now, I think when we grasp this, this has some pretty huge implications, doesn't it? It has big implications, for example, for what my role is as a pastor or, or the other pastors on staff. My job is not to do all the ministry. I hope you realize that. You know, actually, as I teach from the Bible, as I, as I come alongside you to speak into your lives, you know, as I bring God's word to you, the effect should be that you are equipped for ministry. You're equipped to use the gifts God's given you to serve others. Now that should affect, for example, the way you assess the fruit of my ministry. See, in many ways, the test isn't what I can do, is it? What I'm capable of. The test is what you can do as God's people. Because my role in the body is to equip you for ministry. Now maybe you look at our service this morning and think, look, you're not doing very well then, are you, Matthew? It's been largely Matthew this morning. But if we're going to get our heads around this, we've got to realize that the church is much bigger than this service on a Sunday morning. Ministry is not just what happens when we gather together here, is it? You know, maybe, again, I find the illustration helpful of an iceberg. The, the, the public ministry, the services, are the tip of the iceberg. They're the bit we all see, aren't they? But in a healthy church, the vast majority of ministry, the vast majority of serving, of building one another up, is unseen. It's going on during the week. It's messages people are sending one another. It's in growth groups. You know, it's a phone call someone makes or a visit or or a little prayer um, triplet that's going on week by week. You know, in a healthy church, the the visible, the kind of public ministry is just the tip of the iceberg. Or think, you know, if we're going to use the sporting analogy again, think of our service. It's not the game. It's the halftime huddle. What happens in the halftime huddle? You know, everyone gets around, don't they? And the coaches speak some words into the team. So the team get back out there and and get on with it. And that's what, think of our service like that. We gather together, don't we, once a week to hear from God's word so that we go back out into our lives, into the context in which God has called us to serve him. That's a very different picture of the church, isn't it? You know, when people say, where is Sunbridge Road Mission? Or what is Sunbridge Road Mission? We tend to always think of these events, don't we? The Sunday services. But actually, where is Sunbridge? It's all, all over the city, isn't it? It's where we're called to. It's as we meet up during the week. It's as we phone one another. That is the church. That is the ministry of the church. And and that has big implications, not just for me, but for all of us, doesn't it? Paul here is talking about every member ministry. We're all to be involved in serving one another. Now, I think often when we think about what it means to be part of a a church, if we're going to use, if we take the next picture, if we're going to use the sporting, stay in the sporting analogy... We drift into thinking we're in the stands. You know, it feels like that on a Sunday morning, doesn't it? You know, we're watching and some other people are kind of on the pitch doing ministry. 
That's not the picture we should have in our minds. Actually, all, what Paul's saying here is that all of us are on the pitch. You know, all of us have a part to play. All of us are involved. You know, what's going on here is the half-time huddle. But actually, all of us are on the pitch. Who's in the stands? Actually, it's the watching world, isn't it? It's not us within the church. One of the um, uh, commentaries I've been reading on Ephesians um, by John Stott, he shared an illustration of this. He was at a church in America, St. Paul's Church in Connecticut, and uh, on their paper bulletin, it said this on the front. It, it listed the names of the, rev, the rector, which is the kind of name of the pastor, um, Reverend Everett Fulham, and then I think the associate rector. And then underneath that, it said ministers, the entire congregation. Isn't that a helpful way to think about it? So actually, in the, do you see how in the church, there's no spare parts. There's no sitting on the bench. If we're part of the body, then Jesus has given us something to contribute. Now, what's, what's the aim of all this? You know, what's the focus of our serving? Well, we get the answer to that in verses 12 and 13. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Maturity. That's where all this is heading. You know, we're to use our gifts to serve one another so that we grow up together to become more like Christ. So Paul expands on this, really, in verses 14 to 16. Growing up together to become more like Christ. Now, I don't know if you've noticed that toddlers have disproportionately large heads, don't they? So we can have the next slide up. You know, you, you'll see the, the last point down there. Toddlers have disproportionately large heads. You know, things like the, the head and the eyes grow a lot less than the rest of the body. I remember when Henry, our son, was learning to walk. And he probably had the, the largest head out of our children. And it just meant that if, if ever his head went a little bit forward, you know, he was over. Or a little bit back and he was down. Toddlers, in that sense, have to grow up into their heads, don't they? You know, and if their bodies are going to grow, then each part has to do its work. And look, it's the same for us in the church. Christ is our head. So we've got a bit of growing up to do, haven't we? And, and actually, this is the focus of our ministry to one another. To help one another become more like Christ. To become our, our job, if you like, our responsibility to one another, is to help us become the mature body that is fit for our head, the Lord Jesus. You know, we, we're, you see that picture that the child and the adult, you know, we need to grow up so our body is mature and fit for our head. And maturity here means being firm in our convictions. You know, we've been taught God's word so we can stand firm in the truth. Spiritual infants, says Paul, that they're easily thrown about by the wind and the waves. You know, a difficult circumstance comes up and it completely throws them in their faith. Or some unhelpful teaching comes along. You know, maybe they watch something on YouTube or they read a book that someone passes them and it's not really biblical at all, but they lap it up, not realising it's not in line with God's word. Paul says, look, when we mature, it's the other way around. Rather than being influenced by things around us unhelpfully, we influence others as we speak God's truth into their lives. So, you know, how are we going to build each other up towards Christ-likeness? Speaking the truth in love, Paul says. Speaking God's word into each other's lives and situations. You know, that might be sending a verse, mightn't it, to someone. It might be praying with someone over the phone. It, it might be knowing a situation that someone's going through, sharing a scripture that's really helped us when we walk through that. Do you see, a healthy church is a church that's building itself up all the time as we speak God's word to one another. And I think one of the striking things about this passage is that maturity is a corporate thing. So it's not just about us as individuals, is it? We're responsible for each other. So look at just as at the end at verse 16. From him, that is Christ, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So maturity isn't just about how I'm doing as an individual. It's about how we're doing as a church. I think for me, I only really got this um, when I was at university. I'd been a Christian about six or seven years by then, but I think up to that point, I'd really always been thinking about how I grow. You know, what do I need to go that will be benefiting to me? Now, that was a healthy desire, wasn't it, to grow in the Lord spiritually. But I suddenly realized, actually, the Lord might use me to help others grow. 
And that was a game changer. You know, I wasn't just thinking of, of my Christian faith as, a, as an individual thing. Actually, suddenly, I was connected with other believers. And, the, you know, I had a responsibility to encourage and to help them. You know, think again of that, of that image of a body. Imagine someone who goes to the gym every week, you know, but they only get round to working on their right leg. You know, so every week they kind of do half an hour hard work on their right leg, but then it's time to go. So their right leg is super strong, you know, but the rest of them is completely out of shape. Well, they've got their priorities wrong, haven't they? Now imagine a church where one or two individuals are really flying spiritually, you know, pushing on in ministry, but everyone else is spiritually immature. Well, they've got their priorities wrong, haven't they? You know, we're responsible for one another. If we're going to grow to maturity in Christ, actually we need to do that together, with each part doing its work. Now, what, what does all this look like for us? I think the question we need to ask is, are we using the gifts and resources God has given us to serve others? And I realise as I ask that, it's not easy right now, is it? You know, for many of us, the ways we were serving have been stopped. It's not easy to, to, to meet up with people at the moment. But let me just speak into that for a moment. You know, I, I think we've got to be careful as a church. Uh, we don't say, we'll wait until all this COVID stuff is over, and then we'll start to serve again. My, a few years ago, my dad had a, a benign tumour in his knee, and he had to get um, you know, it, it taken out, and it, his knee kind of reconstructed, and a new knee put in. And his leg was in a cast for a long time, for months. Now, when they took the, the cast off, he had serious muscle wastage. You know, his, leg, his muscles were wasted away, and it took a long time to kind of build the leg up again. Now, if we, if we wait until the end of COVID to start serving, when the cast comes off, as it were, it's not going to be very pretty, is it? You know, actually, we'll have had, we'll be spirit, spiritually, our muscles will have wasted away. You know, we, we won't be healthy and fit and strong. And if serving was about programs, then we'd be stuck at the moment, wouldn't we? You know, we can't run many programs at the moment. And lots of the things we'd love being part of, we're not able to run. If serving was about putting on programs, we'd be stuck. But it's not about that, is it? Serving isn't about running programs. It's about building people up. And the people are still here, aren't we? And I, I would have thought most of us realize we need some building up at the moment. <laughs> so do you see, actually, there's no reason for us not to serve right now. I know there's difficulties, but what that means is we need to be creative. We need to think about how we serve one another, but not wait until all this is over. So let me give you some ideas. You know, what could this look like practically? Well, maybe you've got the gift of encouragement. Actually, you're someone who, who, who is quick to think, you know, of where others are at, of maybe how you could encourage them. Maybe that means a phone call. You know, maybe you, you know some people in the church are quite isolated, and so every week you give them a phone call. So at least once a week they've got some interaction with somebody. Or maybe you know someone who's struggling. Maybe you know someone who gets to a Friday night and particularly struggles with loneliness. So every Friday night you give them a ring. Or someone who, who you know is anxious every morning as they look to go to work. And so actually you give them a ring in the morning and just pray with them quickly before they go. There's other ways, aren't there, we can encourage one another. Maybe it's sharing a song that's blessed us and just messaging it to somebody. Maybe, it's sending, maybe we know someone's going through something that's difficult and we, just, we send them a message telling them what we're praying for them. Maybe we ring them and pray over the phone. My parents-in-law sometimes send a, a little um, voice message just with a prayer in, you know, on a Sunday morning to say they're praying for me as, as I minister. It's a great encouragement. Maybe our gift is hospitality. And often we think hospitality is cooking, don't we? You know, and that's hard right now, isn't it? It's hard to have people over for food. But hospitality is much more than cooking. Hospitality at its root is welcoming the outsider, is welcoming the stranger, the person on the edge. And there's a real need for that right now, isn't there? You know, there's a number of people who've recently joined the church family. And this is not an easy time to join a church family, is it? You know, with, it's hard to get to know one another. So maybe hospitality at the moment means, on a Sunday morning, looking out for those maybe who are a bit on their own, who don't know many people, and going over to say hello. Getting, getting their number so you can meet up in the week and go for a walk together so someone can go a little bit deeper than a two-minute chat through a face mask. Maybe it means bubbling with someone who's on their own. What a great way that is to show hospitality at the moment. Maybe you're able to take someone into your bubble. You know, it's a costly way of serving, isn't it? But someone who's on their own, they don't, they don't have people to meet up with. 
They could be part of your family for a season. Maybe it's transport. You know, for lots of people, what, what stops them coming down to things and meeting with other believers is, is transport. You know, maybe actually God's given you a car that you can use to bless others. So the gift of encouragement, it might be hospitality, it might be giving financially. You know, again, all of us are called to give to the work of the Lord financially, aren't we? But for some, this is a particular gift. Maybe because the Lord has blessed them with a salary far above what they need day in, day out. So they can really support others in ministry. Maybe it's because someone just has a particular gift in seeing practical needs and enjoying meeting them. And that might mean, that it might mean giving generously you know, to somebody's road mission. So we could, you know, this is another gift, isn't it? Where when it's not there, we notice. You know, ministry kind of grinds to a halt. But maybe it's, it's also, you know, it doesn't always have to be giving into the, the, the church fund, does it? It might be giving to others that we know are in particular needs and serving them and blessing them in that way. There's all kinds of ways we can serve one another, aren't there, at the moment? You know, it, it might be practical, helping with the cleaning so that we can meet together, helping with the painting and refurbishment that's going on so that groups can meet and be blessed through that. It might be a very simple thing, turning up to growth group every week so you can be an encouragement to others. You know, even if you're not feeling it yourself, so that you can bless them and spur them on. And there's, you know, we need to think about this, don't we? What this might look like. And this is, I think this, you know, this topic is something we want to think more on. And um, I'm going to put something on the app that might just help you think about that. I mean, there'll be people here who've, who've thought about the, the gifts God's given them and are using those uh, to serve. But maybe this is something you want to think more about. You're not sure what gifts God's given you, Jesus has given you to serve, or you don't know how to use them. I'm going to put something on the app. I'll do it as soon as um, after the service. Uh, just with um, a kind of a gift audit, if you like, you know, some questions to ask that maybe will help you to identify the gifts that God has given you. Um, and then just a list of the current teams, uh, you know, here, uh, things like the tech team or the music team. Now, again, that is not exhaustive, is it? What I've been saying is that, that our service goes far outside all the kind of formal stuff that's run, but it might be a good place to start. You know, it might be you think, actually, I could really be a blessing in that context. Well, there's lots to reflect on, isn't there? I get it. I find this passage so exciting. It, it, it's, it's a vision, isn't it, of the church where we're all involved, where we're working together, where God has equipped us to bless one another. You know, and in a season where actually there's a real struggle with purposelessness, what a joy that God has given us purpose. You know, he's given us a role to play in the work that he's doing. So I'm just going to give us a little pause to reflect, um, and then I'll... Um, and then in a, in a couple of minutes, the musicians will lead us uh, in a final song that reminds us uh, of, of who it is that we're serving. Lord God, we thank you that you have united us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we're so grateful to be part of your body. And we pray that you would help us to live out that unity. Lord, to work hard at maintaining peace with one another. Particularly, Lord God, when we're struggling and feeling under strain. Give us gentleness and humility and patience. Father, we, we, we thankful too that you involve us in the work that you're doing and how we long to grow up to maturity. Lord, what a privilege to have you as our head and how we long to grow up in that. And Father, thank you for the gifts that you've given us, that you've given each of us. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to see what those are and, and give us courage and joy in using the gifts and resources that you've given us to serve others, to strengthen one another. Lord, we praise you that you give each of us a part in the work that you're doing. Lord, we, we thank you that we can look forward to the day when we will be made like Christ. And we long day by day to grow up in that direction. Thank you that you will finish this work that you've started. That one day uh, we will be unveiled. The body will be unveiled. Uh, we will be unveiled in glory. Lord, we am, we're amazed to be part of that work. Um, so we, we pray, Lord God, that you would put these things on our hearts. Help us to see the gifts that you've given us. Um, encourage us, Lord God, to use them 
We're so grateful for one another. Lord, we see this working itself out already. We're so thankful uh, for the way in which we're served by others in the church family. And we pray you'd help us to be a part of that. In Jesus' name, amen.